One more session on verse 17 of Philippians 3. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes, fix your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. That is Timothy and Paul who are sending this letter together. Last time we just focused on the fact of imitation in the Christian life. And in this session, we want to ask what in particular does Paul want them to focus on, keep their eyes on when he asks them to do this. Father, now we move from the fact of imitation to the content, and I pray that you would make this even more pressing and glorious for us, that you would work it in us, that we would be the kind of people that people may look at and benefit from by looking at our lives. Show us what in particular they should see, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So what had he just said? Brothers, join in imitating me. Sounds like he's trying to say, well, I just, I just told you what I do. Now imitate it. Well, let's look. Here's 13 to 16. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. This pressing on, this, this attaining to the, to the perfection. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. I press on, this is what he does, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So the great second coming, I want to make it to the resurrection, through the resurrection, into the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, which is almost the same as, imitate me. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Think this way. So imitate. Imitate, right? I've just showed you how to think and act about the value of the second coming. Think that way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you. So I would say that when he says here, join in imitating me, he's making explicit what he has said here in think this way. And so one meaning of what they are to imitate is imitate Paul's passion to attain the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is the second coming. And now that's confirmed by the way he now proceeds because he says, the reason I want you to imitate me Here's the reason. The reason I want you to imitate me in this way is that many of whom I have told you before and I'll tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, not the second coming. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things, not the second coming. But, so there's the negative. You don't want to be like these people people. But what do you want to be like? But our citizenship is in heaven. So that's where he's looking. He's straining forward in heaven and from it we await. Isn't that virtually the same as I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We are waiting for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even to subject all things to himself. So here is the positive. So this is negative and this is positive. You don't want to be in this crowd here. You don't want to imitate them. No, no, no. Many have have gone out like that, and I don't want you to be like that, but I want you to be looking at me or us. 
because we are waiting for a Savior, just like I told you back here in what I called you to imitate. So the first meaning of imitate, or the first content of imitate, is be so uh, ravished by the prospect of being with Jesus that you lean forward into his second coming like this or like this here in 314. Now, it's clear that Paul had set us up for that early on because here in 120, he said, my eager expectation and hope is that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, because he goes on to say in verse 23, that to die is to be with Christ. And in 3.7, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. So he has made it really clear that this imitation here that he wants them to have is the imitation of his passion for Jesus, his passion to be with Jesus at death, with Jesus in fullness, with a new body, a new body at his second coming. But now here's a, here's a glitch. You always want to attend very closely to the actual wording. It says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk. So almost everything I've said up until now has had to do with Paul's attitude and his desires and his passion and what he treasures and what he's leaning into with his whole soul. But what this verse is focusing on here is a walk. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So we're not just to look at what Paul desires, loves, treasures, but the way he walks. Now that's confirmed almost immediately as you keep going in reading just a few verses later. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. What you've seen in me, practice these things. Not just think these things, not just feel these things, but practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So we have to ask then, okay, all right, got to own up to what the text really says. And it says that we are to imitate his walk. So Paul doesn't want us to disconnect the passions of Paul from the practice of Paul. What would that be? We can just, just follow him through the letter, right? My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on, on your account. In other words, I've got a life to live for others, not just a, a, a joy to experience for myself. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress of joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. You can see the action here. This is Paul living, not just feeling. He's living, he's doing things that bring about joy in other people because Paul's joy gets bigger when his joy overflows into their joy. Or go back earlier. I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What had happened to him? So that it has become through the, through, known throughout the whole imperial guard that all, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So Paul has so lived as to get his body imprisoned. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. So he's rejoicing in his imprisonment and calling them to know it, to know it so that they can imitate not only his attitudes, but his very imprisonment if they must. Or here's Philippians 2, 17 and 18. I am, if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. So he's ready to die 
for their faith. And if I am to be poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad. And I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. So imitate my glad willingness to be poured out for the faith of other people. That's the whole package of Paul's gladness in Christ and his acting on that gladness for the sake of the faith of others. And of course, we already looked last time at 2, 5 to 8, where Jesus lived out with practice his lowliness and humility in serving others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. So there is a, there is a mindset that he wants the Philippians to imitate, that he has a, a passion for Jesus and a passion for God and a passion for other people's faith. And there's a huge inner dimension to Paul's spiritual life. But... It's a mindset that produces action, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient unto the death, even death on a cross. That's the kind of life that Paul wants them to imitate. So, summing up, He wants them to imitate his passion for Jesus and the second coming. But there is a behavior that follows that kind of passion. It's a passion that releases one from living with a mind set on earthly things so that your God is your belly and your end is destruction. It keeps you from falling into that trap And instead, when you have this hope right here, that you're someday, after the imprisonments and after the suffering, going to receive a glorious body by the power of Jesus that enables him to subject all things to himself, when Paul finally sees him and becomes like him, then Paul's desire will have reached its fullness. And that kind of hope produces the kind of obedience that we are to imitate when we walk like Paul.